Atsukia, Tukia Tiurunga, Atsukia, Tukia Tewanga, Komarma Tiko, 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 Ya, E Fakarahia, Hiramai Te Hira, Aramai Te Ara, He Manu Pakarungo, Tupua Koa Te Manu Nei, Wā Te Tōri Auta, Ko Fete Fete Mai Angotu, Ko Tū Ki Taha Maui, Ko Rongo Ki Taha Matau, Tuturu Whakamawa Ki A Tina. O mi e, ui e, Tāhi. A krori ki te atua i runga rawa, he maunga rongo ki runga, te matua te penua he whakaaro pai ki ngā tangata katoa. A tihai, mauri tu, a tihai, mauri ora. A tihai, mauri ora. A te whare e tu nei, e tu e tu. Ki ngā hunga mate, ngā hunga mate kua haere, 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 haere atu, haere, haere ki waiki nui, waiki roa, waiki pā māma. A, haere. Ki ngā hunga ora, ai te hunga ora, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Ka apiti hono tātai hono, hunga mate ki te hunga mate, ka apiti hono tātai hono, te hunga ora ki te hunga ora. Ai ki te hunga ora. Ngā tangata whenua e tūnei, tēnā koutou ngā iwi e waru, e noho ana nei, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Ngā rangatira mā, kua tai mai ki tēnei, ki te tautoko o tēnei hui. No mai, no mai, hara mai. Ngā toi kua lewa o tākau. No mai, no mai, hara mai. Ki te Care Foundation, kua tautoko o tēnei hui. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Ngā haue pā, kua tai mai ki tēnei, ki te tautoko o tēnei hui ako ngā. No mai, no mai, hara mai. Nō reina, kei te mihi, kei te mihi, ko Alex Brown tōku ingoa, he tākuta ki te hoki pera ki panei. Nō reina, no mai, no mai, haere mai, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. What I said was, hello. I said a brief, what's called a tauparapara, which is a prayer, which talks about the beginning of time, the dawning of man and the dawning of knowledge, and the conflict that comes with it. Um, I then uh, talked uh, to the dead and uh, told them to go away um, uh, to their place of rest. And uh, then I addressed the building and told it to keep standing, which is a good idea. And then um, I um, spoke to our esteemed guests, um, the iwi that um, resides here, the, the eight iwi that are, uh, resides here, and then to you, our audience, and welcome you to this lecture about uh, sleep. So welcome everyone, and um, I'd like to give the floor. Thanks. Uh, kia ora koutou, my name's uh, Suzanne Pitama, and it's my real privilege to be in Nelson today. I'm the Dean and Head of Campus of the Otago, University of Otago based in Christchurch. Um, and we're really grateful as a campus that uh, Nelson hosts our final year medical students uh, throughout the Nelson Marlborough area. Um, and I would like to first acknowledge the uh, Care Foundation uh, based here at the top of the South Health Charity. And I especially acknowledge Claire Haycock, who is present today. The charity mm, supports healthcare and uh, education initiatives and innovations within the Nelson Marlborough area. And there are many donors of the Care Foundation, including people who are in their experience as patients have been motivated through their own experiences to pay it forward and support the health environment. We thank, we really thank the Care Foundation for their support uh, of the community health lectures here in Nelson. And today, uh, on such a beautiful Nelson day, we begin the first of, of a series um, of these lectures for 2023. And um, I just wanted to start uh, by saying for each of us, the gift of ha or the, the gift of breath is a privilege we often take for granted until our own breathing or breathing of those we love or care about is impacted. Uh, so today we have the privilege of hearing from two amazing experts, uh, Professor Lutz Beckett, who's a colleague of mine from Christchurch and a respiratory physician, and Dr. Doran Kokodi, uh, I said accidentally a Scottish word with a Māori accent, so I apologise, uh, who is a general practitioner here in Nelson with a special interest and speciality in sleep. Um, who are going to guide us through some key points that as a, how as a community we can be informed about our hauora, our health, especially in regards to ha or the breath going forward. 
Now there will be time at the end, so exciting, to ask really hard questions of our speakers and to have them answered. And I will facilitate those on your behalf. And I just also wanted to acknowledge the many people that are joining us uh, online and via Zoom today. So kia ora and can we please welcome Professor Lutz Beckett and Dr. Doran Kikodi to the stage, kia ora. I start, sir. That's a good start. In a quarter katoa. Um, that's a great start. <laughs> Tēnā kōta katoa, ki elbe te āwa. Slide slow work. Ti elbe te āwa, ko Germany i te e te whenua e te katupuna i te tō 1998, ara mai i ki e a tō rua, ko Lutz Beckert tāku ingua, tēnā kōta, tēnā kōta, tēnā kōta katoa. And while we're getting the slides ready, so thank you very much for sort of coming in here on a sunny day. Thank you for inviting us to a beautiful Nelson. And behind me is now sort of my river, my Ava. And Alex, we are known as the Flatlanders. So there really there are, no, there are no mountains at all. So this is my river. That's a contemporary picture as the car advertising gives away. And so this river really, and, uh, really connects me to New Zealand. I've been in New Zealand for about 25 years. I'm married to a New Zealand girl, and I'm very lucky that the University of Otago has given me a home. And uh, yeah, I might just, uh, do you think the slides are working now? Oh, brilliant, thank you very much. So when we, uh, uh, when we, were, when we planned the session, I had suggested that I could sort of do this as an interpretive dance. And Durin was really quite keen on this. And after, after all, we on a stage on the theater. But then I was reminded that I'm here really on behalf of the university. So no interpretive dance, sorry, students. Uh, uh, it, uh, it wouldn't have been good. But uh, the giveaway is that I'm quite partial to one of these social media things, uh, to TikTok. I love TikTok. So if you ever have a chance to look at your grandchildren or children's TikTok, it's worthwhile. And I quite like the theme, five things I wouldn't do, you know, five things I would never do again as a travel agent. Stay in front of the victim because otherwise you're not going to be seen on the Zoom meeting. Oh, Zoom meeting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, would you mind staying on? I don't mind. No. And apologies. I should have That's all right. Here. In this case, five, uh, five things I would never do as a travel agent, or five things I wouldn't do as a divorce lawyer, or five things I wouldn't do as an auto electrician. And I thought, oh, maybe as a spiritual physician, I can do the same. What, what would I say? Five things which I wouldn't do as a spiritual physician. And I thought I put a slide up and let people vote, but then I said it's too boring because the, first, uh, the uh, one thing I really would never do as a respiratory physician is to use the lungs as a delivery system for drugs. So if you like nicotine, don't use the lungs via cigarettes or via vapors to get the nicotine in. Uh, no opinion to cannabis, don't use the lungs to get the cannabis into your body. Don't use antibiotics. And some of my colleagues are really clever and thought, if they could inhale insulin, we could avoid, avoid needles. No good. It really does not work. So this is our line as respiratory physicians. We have a summary document published, which is 432 pages. And we really can summarize it as the lungs are designed to breathe fresh, clean air, not lower level of toxins. And this one sentence really combines them all. Sort of, we have one sentence, and we're saying, do not smoke, do not vape, do not inhale cannabis, do not expose yourself to diesel fumes, be careful with environmental pollutions and uh, uh, fumes from, uh, from forest fires. The lungs should be there to bring fresh, clear, fresh clean air. The next bit I would never do as a respiratory physician is to take an old antibiotic called nitrofurin -tuin. And nobody will remember the name, but uh, bladder infections, recurrent bladder infections can be quite a nuisance if we, uh, if we end up having one. 
And while it's never a great idea to take constant antibiotics, sometimes doctors sort of do prescribe chronic antibiotics. But if this happens, can you ask them to make sure it's not nitrofurantoin? This might not show up nicely, but this is an uh, this is an X-ray from a woman who was quite well until the doctor gave her nitrofurantoin. And following a lung biopsy and a bleed later, we stopped the nitrofurantoin and her lungs are back normal again. Number two might upset a few people. But do not, as a responsibility business, I would never keep a bird as a pet. Uh, there are sticky proteins which come with, uh, come with birds. They, you, they come from their saliva and their feathers. When they clean themselves, they dry up and you cannot keep them out. And this is an, uh, again an X-ray from one of my patients. She had a normal X-ray. And then her husband decided to keep a few birds just outside in a loft, just some pigeons. They're really quite nice. Most of the time they spend the time away. And this is her X-ray just before she needed a lung transplant. And then unfortunately she has now died following the lung transplant. So it's not a great idea to keep birds as pets. And it's not good for the birds either. It's not a good idea. We're ending more safer grounds and, uh, and saying, so if I want to have my snoring investigated, and half of us, half of us snore at any time in our lives, particular men, do not use a really complicated test called poly many graphy measurements during the sleep is not needed. It's expensive, it's hard to get hold of. And what you need is an overnight oximetry, which is simple, which is reliable and can be used at home. And this is also the topic Doreen will, uh, will be talking about. And I leave you with a wee cliffhanger. I'll come back to this in a moment. But in case you know somebody who has asthma or you have it yourself, do not use Ventolin or Sabutamol to treat asthma. Sabutamol is a chemical name and it's sold in New Zealand as Respogen, uh, Salier, it's not many of you use Salier, and Ventolin. I would never use this drug to treat asthma. And I leave you with this cliffhanger and I, I hand, over to my, uh, hand over to my colleague who's going to go a little bit more about uh, the uh, uh, about one aspect, and uh, I can hear see there's some more. The microphone is running out, is it? Anyway, I hand over. Excellent, I can do this. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doran Kokodi. Are we working? Good afternoon, everyone. Am I working now? I'll just do it. The microphone. Yeah. So my name is Doran Kokodi. I'm a Nelson GP, and I've been in Nelson. Oh, we've got work now. I think I'm working now. Yeah, I've been a Nelson GP for um, almost 20 years now. Um, so I developed a special interest in sleep medicine with a bit of extra study. And yeah, just like to share some of that with you. There's a lot of people out there with snoring, but more importantly, sleep apnea. And it makes them sleepy and grumpy as well as health issues. And so that's really who we're looking for. It affects about 10% of men and 20% 10, uh, 10 of women and 25% of men. And it increases after the age of 40 years. And obesity is the most important. Probably because the sun's here. Oh, yes. Does that work now? Yeah. yeah. It's probably that. Yeah. 
she's moving away. That's better. We've just got one working now. Yeah, so it's common and it's common as people get older. Um, so risk factors, being a man, family history. So if you've got a parent who's a loud snorer, um, obesity, obviously. If you have a small jaw or throat, or if you have some big tonsils sitting in there, and that's more common in younger people. Other things that we can have more effect over are smoking, if we're drinking a lot of alcohol and some health conditions, so neuromuscular disease, underactive thyroid, polycystic ovary syndrome, and pregnancy. All of these things are just either having an effect on making your throat smaller or causing some inflammation on your throat and reducing the space there as well. In Britain, they do things a bit differently. They obviously move people around depending on how their snoring's going, but we haven't got to that point in New Zealand yet. Symptoms, so choking or waking gasping for breath at night. If you're stopping breathing for 10 seconds or longer, and your partner might notice this, but people often don't. You can be stopping breathing a lot and your partner doesn't always know that's going on. A loud snorer, dry mouth or sore throat overnight. You might also be getting up to the toilet two to three times overnight. You wake up unrefreshed, feeling tired and groggy. You might have a headache in the morning and you can't concentrate over the day. It's going to make your sleep quality very poor. You're not going to work very well. You may have accidents either at work or when you're driving. Your memory is not great and it can affect your mood. Hamster clearly had sleep apnea, but you know, motor vehicle accidents in New Zealand, there's probably about 30% can be put down to fatigue. What are we going to do about it? So if you have suspicions, then your doctor will take a history. We can measure your height, your weight, work out your body mass index, measure your neck. So if someone has a bigger neck, there's increased risk. Check your blood pressure. So if someone has high blood pressure, especially if it's difficult to treat and you're on lots of different medications, then it's good to just think sleep apnea could be a driving force behind that as well. And also we would examine your nose and throat to see if there was any narrowing, if there was a restricted space back there. We also generally get people to fill out a questionnaire, the simplest of which is the EPCO sleepiness scale score. And it's just a measure of um, how sleepy someone would be. People tend to sometimes underscore themselves. I find it quite useful to get somebody to score it with their partner. We often get a more accurate measure because partners are often a bit more aware of when someone's dropping off all the time. And also, I sometimes, if I'm very suspicious, I'll, I'll really go through it with somebody myself if they've scored low and I think it maybe should be a bit higher. Diagnosis. So, as Lutz mentioned, we were going to primarily do overnight oximetry. And really, it's just the simple oximeter on your finger, which is measuring your pulse and your oxygen. And we're really measuring how many times someone is stopping breathing overnight. We're all allowed to stop breathing up to four times an hour overnight. Five to 14 is mild sleep apnea, 15 to 29 is moderate, and anything over 30 is severe. Now, obviously, if someone gets towards the lower ranges, then it's going to be having more impacts on their health. But there's certainly, I see a lot of people with mild sleep apnea who it's still making them feel really bad. So you don't have to have severe sleep apnea for it to be having a significant impact on your life. This is overnight oximetry. So this chap's in his late, six, late 50s, um, and he's, the top line is the oxygen, the green line. And it really should be more of a straight line. My pointer will work. Hmm. Don't know if anyway, um, we're, we're at straighter. And then we've got um, lots of big dips happening. And these big dips is when this person's stopping breathing. And their oxygen at times is getting down even to the low 70s, into the, into the 60s even. Um, if I had the oximeter on my finger and stopped breathing during the day, and I have tried this, I'll start at about 99, I'll hold my breath, hold my breath. I can't get it to drop below about 96. If I was asleep and stopped breathing for some reason, it would drop a little bit lower than this, but generally I wouldn't go below about 86. Um, but people with sleep apnea are dropping down into the 80s, the 70s, and even the 60s. So they're stopping breathing for a long time. 
And it's also the fact they're repeatedly doing this overnight. And if they're stopping breathing, the oxygen's dropping, carbon dioxide's going up, their brain's detecting that, and it doesn't like that situation, and it gets their body to pump out a whole pile of adrenaline, which is a bit like an alarm bell to their brain, to make them wake up into a lighter sleep again and get them breathing again. And all this adrenaline is making their heart race, and it's pushing their blood pressure up. And we can see in the heart chasing the blue one that when we've got lots of squiggles in the green lines, we get lots of squiggles in the blue lines. So that's just surges of adrenaline that's happening all night. So we end up with a situation that's making us feel tired. It's having an impact on our cardiovascular system with all this adrenaline surge going on. And we also have this elevated stress response going on overnight, which has an impact on our metabolism. So our blood sugar goes up, affects our cholesterol. It interferes with our pituitary, so we pee more overnight. So it's having all these metabolic effects on our body. And so that's why it's really important for all these negative health impacts. How do we treat it? So if it's mild, we can manage it by lifestyle changes. So losing weight, stopping smoking, avoiding excess alcohol. So, you know, having one or two drinks is fine, but anything more is going to sedate our brain and relax our muscles more. Keep active. And for some people, if it's mild, avoid sleeping on your back. Again, from mild obstructive sleep apnea or snoring, we can try and make the hole bigger. So we can do this by pulling the jaw forward, holding the tongue forward at night with a mandibular splint. So that would hold it in the same position we're doing during the day, but at night it's all collapsing back. So a, a, a jaw splint can help hold the airway open. And sometimes ENT surgery can also help to make the airway a bit bigger, for example, if someone has large tonsils. However, if someone has moderate or severe obstructive sleep apnea, those treatments are not enough to work. And so the gold standard treatment is CPAP. And CPAP just means continuous positive air pressure. And it's essentially an air splint, which again is just keeping the hole open all night. It's a small compressor, it's quite quiet, and it just makes the sound like a gentle heat pump, like we're hearing at the moment. And it's a mask pushing the air into the back of your throat. For about 70% of people, they'll wear a mask over their nose, but some people do need it over their mouth as well. And most people get used to it really quickly and they love their CPAP because they feel so much better on it, even sometimes after a couple of nights. So remember, there are a lot of middle-aged men and women and some younger people who are suffering from obstructive sleep apnea. And it's not just the fact it's making people feel tired, it's actually the negative health impacts as well. So it's good to be aware of it. So thank you very much. And I'll pass you back to Lutz as he left you on the cliffhanger. <laughs> are you quite happy with the screen? Now? Yes, I'm happy to go there. So that's, that was my last slide on the bits which I wouldn't be doing as a facility physician, uh, smoking or taking out of for touring, taking, uh, keeping boots and using complicated tests. And I left you there with the sabutamol and saying, man, many of you probably have seen this blue inhaler and it's almost been said as saying, well, the blue inhaler, you mu um, asthma must be, the asthma and blue inhaler are sort of linked together. And I thought I spent the next sort of uh, four or five minutes to just justify, I mean, if I justify sort of uh, my position a little. Just going to go quickly through the question: it, Is this a problem? Is anybody using the blue inhaler at all? And uh, uh, so, yeah, good. <laughs> uh, but, but and what is the problem with the blue inhaler? And why did we once think the blue inhaler was a good idea? What should we do instead? And where should our treatment, what should we aim for in our treatment? If I do this, I'm right. Good. Oop. Right. So that's the first question. Does anybody use Sabutamol? So I'm sorry for the slightly busy slide. I thought I'd share with you some sort of raw data. So this is data from Pharmac. Pharmac publishes this data each year, what we uh, spend on medication. And if you look carefully, the red one is the sabutamol. So that is the, that is the sabutamol drug. And Pharmac is mainly concerned about the cost. And actually, sabutamol, in the scheme of things, is relatively cheap. I'm more concerned about how much sabutamol do we prescribe. And if you follow the, the sabutamol prescriptions through, 
you can see that in the last time Pharma, Pharma published data like this in 2016, four population of about 5 million in New Zealand, us doctors prescribe 1 million inhalers of sabutamol. So we do use a lot of sabutamol. And I don't mind people using sabutamol for whatever, ingrown toenails make the hair grow for uh, COPD, but don't use it for asthma. And this, uh, the next slide is sort of saying, so what is the problem with sabutamol? Why don't we like to treat it? Why don't we like it, like it for asthma? And this is a graph published from my colleague Richard Beasley in, uh, in Wellington just this year. He did a nice montage. On one side, he sort of ranked how good are medications to control the asthma. And here, what is the risk of medications to, re uh, to reduce an asthma attack? So you're taking the sabutamol and you're hoping not to get an asthma attack. You're hoping to feel better. And down here in this corner, uh, using Ventolin by itself has virtually no chance of reducing accelerations and doesn't improve quality of life greatly, doesn't improve asthma control. And actually, even if you combine the sabutamol with another drug, it's really, it takes quite a while to get your asthma better controlled. And I'll come back to this one in a moment, but a low dose single inhaler maintenance and adjustable therapy, this is the one which gives you the largest, highest quality of life and a medium dose gives you the, better, the highest chance of not having an asthma exacerbation. So quite a few people sort of probably been taking Ventolin and the question, so why, why did we ever think that Ventolin was a good idea? And here's another, another cartoon, not a particular funny cartoon, but it's certainly a cartoon and this, uh, describing what does Ventolin do? So this is really sabutamol or Ventolin, and it's abbreviated here as beta-2, a receptor agonist. Uh, that's sort of the chemical action of sabutamol, and it does something good. When patients come with an asthma attack to the emergency department, we give this as a nebulizer, and it relaxes the smooth buses in the airway. The airway is opening up, and people can breathe better. And this emergency treatment made us think that sabutamol might be a good idea. The same drug does not only act on the smooth muscles on the airway, it also acts on the other cells which are in the airways. And actually on the rest of the cells, the, the epithelium, the lining of the airways, it is quite irritating. And the lining of the airways, it causes increased sputum secretion, increased so-called eosinophils, these are these uh, these uh, red dotted cells, increased cough, and rather inflamed airways, which then, co of course, cause uh, more constriction of the muscles. And you, you can see how you could end up in a vicious circle. And we indeed in New Zealand had some problems with, est uh, with uh, asthma mortality, that you just end up giving more and more sabita mold and feed and feed this loop. So the next question is, well, if we don't really like sabutamol other than an emergency department, and even this is probably a bit dubious, uh, a bit dubious. if we don't really like sabutamol, what else should we be doing? And this is taken out of the asthma guidelines. So uh, uh, these are the New Zealand uh, adolescents and adult asthma guidelines. And basically it comes down to this one inhaler. Overseas, there are more inhalers, but in New Zealand, there's only one inhaler and I'm not getting sponsored by this company. Uh, but this one inhaler is a combination inhaler. It has a steroid in it, and it also has a rapid onset of a long-acting beta agonist in there. And if you ever had asthma as a child in adolescence, you may recall that the, the explanations we try to give as doctors was really very complicated, saying you should be taking the brown inhaler on a regular basis, but if you need more, you take the blue one on top. If you take too much of the blue one, you need to take more of the brown ones, you take less of the blue one. And nobody could follow this, nobody did. We have good data that nobody listened to us. It is much easier now that patients only have one inhaler. 
And, uh, and uh, the one inhaler, most patients over summer are actually fine. They don't need any regular inhalers and patients know very well when they need to take an extra inhaler, when they start wheezing, before they go outside, uh, or, or if they st start having a dry, irritating cough. Sometimes, if it happens a lot, patients take one inhaler in the mornings, one at night, and can, on top of it, take, uh, take some more of this inhaler. And this sort of the one inhaler taken on a regular basis, plus as needed, is abbreviated to SMART therapy, single inhaler maintenance and adjusted rescue therapy. The low dose is the one where patients have the highest quality of life, very few side effects on medication, easy to take, and it, it, it kept the airways inflammation controlled. And if people like, if, you, if your grandchildren come to visit or you're meeting people with viral infection like coronaviruses or other viruses, it can trigger, it can trigger the asthma. And then people should, uh, should be taking two puffs twice daily, plus as many as they need up to 12 puffs a day. And on the graph, this was the point which gave you the highest chance of never needing to go to hospital and not needing a uh, and not needing a um, nebulizer or emergency treatment. So our treatment for asthma has become much simpler by having one inhaler only, much cheaper for patients, only one discharge cost, and much easier to think to uh, to even remember. If I feel wheezy, take this one inhaler I have. Much easier instructions. And that sort of gets me to my last point, which I want to discuss. Well, if you're talking about treating asthma, what are we aiming for? Because the, many of the trials have been designed with clearly measurable outcomes. And you can measure when somebody comes to hospital. And uh, do you remember so the, the slide, the cartoon, where we, where we had people in hospital and we gave them sabutamol, they, and, they, and even so the sabutamol helped the immediate attack, but three, four hours later, an inflammation started, go, started going, but by then they were out of the emergency department. So it took us a while to put this, uh, put us a while to put this all together. And really, my, the, the message now is that as respiratory physicians, we really need to get our act together. It is absolutely silly to treat people just uh, to, uh, to just for an uh, acute infection uh, or acute exacerbation, and then let them go home again only to bounce back. We don't do this with blood pressure tablets. We're not saying, have you had a stroke today? No. Oh, yes, I had a bit of a TIA. Oh, you better take a blood pressure tablet for a day or two. No, we take, give people blood pressure tablets every single day so that we avoid people ever having strokes or heart attack. Our colleagues in rheumatology have long done, the, done this. Our, uh, instead of waiting for people with deformed joints, which are rather sore, and then you give a course of prednisone, and then they get, the joints get sore again, we now give disease-modifying drugs so that people don't have these attacks of rheumatoid arthritis. Or if you know people with inflammatory bowel disease, in the past we waited for uh, past we waited for people having in hospital. Then we had emergency operations which we could do or high dose steroids. Now we keep the inflammation controlled, and it's time for us to do the same for asthma. Uh, our mission for asthma we would love to cure it, but our our mission for asthma is at least if we can't cure it, keep people in remission keep people in remission most of the time by stopping the sabutamol, by using the red inhaler only. And this slide has sort of a few more suggestions doctors can do if, it, uh, if you're amongst the 10% where uh, it's a, uh, a bit more difficult. But really our aim for asthma is that, we, uh, that patients should have no symptoms, no uh, asthma attacks at normal optimized lung functions. And so th that is really my sort of main take hope message. And I'm, I'm pleased that a few people uh, are here because you can go back to your own doctors and saying, why do I get asthma attacks? Can't we, can, can't we sort out the treatment so that I'm well, that my lung functions are normal and don't give me any treatments which sort of just treat an attack. Keep me well, keep the, uh, keep the lungs controlled, keep the lungs at normal functions, the tools we have. And that's really the end of my sections. On the uh, this is the end of my section on the asthma control. We're going the correct direction. So yes, lots of people still use sabutamol. So I'm very pleased that people are here, so we can start having this discussion. They we used to think it's a good idea when we were focusing too much. What are we doing? The emergency department. In reality, we have better medications, and in reality, we should be aiming for asthma remission 
not aiming from emergency room apartment treatment to emergency department treatment. And we have, have a, I hand back to my colleagues, there is a bit of a chance for questions later. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Lutz. Now, insomnia. I could talk about this for three days, but we're going to compress it. <laughs> and yeah, we'll keep a few cartoons going because you'll all be starting to fall asleep anyway. So um, yeah, we all know what this feels like. So sleep, it's food for the brain. There's a lot of important body functions happening and brain activity. If we don't get enough, we're going to feel moody. We don't feel that great. It can make us grumpy. Our family and friends don't like us much. And you're more likely to have an accident, get injured, or become unwell because your immune system doesn't work so well. And again, we're all kind of aware how this works. During the day, we might feel tired watching the movie when we're driving home from work. And the second we hit bed, ping, we can't go off to sleep. And that's generally, a lot of the time, it's just because our, our, our natural stress response, which is kind of keeps us going during the day, it should be switching off in the evening. And often it isn't switching off very well. In normal sleep, what should happen is we should go off into deep sleep. We have a look after about a, roughly a 90 minute cycle, we'll have a bit of a dream, a bit more deep sleep, a bit of a dream. The red REM sleep is when we do our dreaming. And in the second half of the night, we spend a lot more in lighter sleep and there's a lot more of the REM and dreaming sleep. So it's, we're all light sleepers. I love it when people come and tell me they're a light sleeper. We're all light sleepers, but we all actually get a bit of deep sleep as well. You're not any different to anybody else. But when we're in dreaming sleep, it's completely normal for all of us to wake up four or five times overnight and have a brief awakening, and then we go back to sleep again. And most of us have no idea that we're doing it. But sometimes if our stress response is a bit elevated, then we'll wake up and we'll stay awake. So waking up overnight is a completely normal phenomenon and everybody has done it every single night of their life. And most of the time they don't know it's happening. So it's not the waking up that's the issue. It's the ability to relax and go back to sleep again, which is often the problem. The other thing controlling sleep is our normal circadian cycle. And that's controlled by melatonin, which is produced in the pituitary in pineal gland in our brain. And the melatonin comes up in the evening, it's cooling our body. And so blood goes to our hands and feet and our core cools. So we won't go off to sleep until our core is cool enough. So that's what melatonin is doing in the evening. So if I was going to sleep at 10, it would start coming up about five and it would get to a point, I was, my body was cool enough, I would go off to sleep. It would continue to cool me overnight. And then if I was waking at six, it would cool me until about four, I would be at my coolest. And then my body would naturally start warming again. And again, it's a natural warming that makes us generally wake up about the same time each day. So I would wake up at six. We used to live in caves and go outside. And our body really likes getting outside light. And outside light is really good at switching off our melatonin. And so even in a bright room inside, we may be getting about 2,000 lux, which is a measure of brightness. Outside, it's about 100 to 150,000. So it's really good to get outside light in the morning for about 40 to 60 minutes, if you can, before 11 o'clock. It's really good for our sleep cycle. It's free and it's easy to do. <laughs> and no sunglasses when you do that. So what is insomnia? So we all think we probably know it's present when you find it hard to sleep or stay asleep. So you might have trouble getting to sleep. You might get to sleep, but you're waking up again, or you might just be regularly waking up on and off all night. Some people have two or even three of the above, and then we're going to feel tired. Three out of four heads in my voices want to sleep. The other want to know if penguins have knees. I mean, we all know what that's like in the middle of the night. We're lying there thinking about stupid things. And also to remember at night, most of our brain's gone to gone off, trying to go off to sleep. And it's the little amygdala, amygdala, which is a very primitive, reactive part of our brain that is working at night. And it does make us think about stupid things. So it's best not to pay too much attention to it. What causes it? So medication, drugs, caffeine, alcohol, smoking, so stimulants, pain discomfort, 
stress. So that could be work or school, personal stress, bereavement, relationship, financial, and anxiety and depression. Most people have experienced insomnia at some point in their lives. And at any given time, there's about 10% of people. So there's quite a few people in this room. How are we going to sleep better? During the day, so as I said, get out in the sun in the morning. Exercise is good, but we don't want to do it too close to bedtime. Better um, give at least three to four hours, because again, we want our body to cool. Try not to go to bed during the day. If you really have to have a nap during the day, then you should really make it a power nap, sort of 10 to 20 minutes. We don't want to go down into deep sleep during the day. That's going to interfere with our nighttime sleep. So short nap is okay, but best to avoid if you can. Beds for sleeping. We shouldn't be doing study or TV or phone calls or gaming or reading or whatever else people do in their bedroom. Yeah, sleeping in the bed, it should be quiet. It makes it harder to sleep if we're doing multiple tasks because our brain stops linking it with bed and sleep. Meal, you want to have your main meal at least three hours before bedtime to allow digestion and body cooling. You don't want to be hungry when you go to bed, so small snacks, okay, um, but a big full stomach will interfere with sleep. Nap attacks, cats are pretty good at that, but just try and avoid. So in the evening, being aware of that internal body clock, and it does work much better if we have a regular routine, which means going to bed and getting up at the same time if you can. If that's working well, you will naturally feel sleepy at bedtime. You don't want to go to bed too early because if your body's not ready, you're not going to go to sleep and you're just going to be lying there wondering why you're not going to sleep. And again, one hour before bed, it's really important to have a nice relaxing sleep routine. You just let your body relax, have a good a good routine so that it gets used to it. What you shouldn't be doing, um, avoiding the stimulants. So coffee, tea, coke, dark chocolate's got a ton of caffeine in it. Some people are really caffeine sensitive and I'm one of them. I mean, I can have a couple of cups of tea in the morning and that's me. Not everybody's like that. My husband can drink a cup of coffee before he goes to bed and he's fine, but that's him. And so we just got to be aware that caffeine can have a real impact on us. And, and if you're not sleeping well, then minimize it. Get it out of your system for a while and see what impact that has. Alcohol will sedate you, but it does have a stimulant effect later in the night. So it will wake you up again and make it harder to get back to sleep. Avoid doing all the stimulating busy things before bed. And um, the blue light in the evening, which we're going to get from screens, is also interfering with our natural melatonin rise. So TV on the other side of the room, room is not so bad. Dimly lit rooms, it tends to be the, the screens in our faces. And again, don't fall asleep on the couch if you can, because that is a then going to interfere with your ability to fall asleep when you go to bed. We stress a lot about sleep. Um, calculating the exact amount of sleep I'll get if I fall asleep right this second. You know, we tend to lie there and stress about it all. That doesn't help. We'll never make ourselves go to sleep. We have to let ourselves go to sleep. So the bedroom should be comfortable, dark and quiet. Minimize distractions. You shouldn't really be able to look at the clock. 16 to 18 degrees, ideal. That can be hard at this time of year when it's hot. Warm hands and feet. So if you have cold hands and feet, the melatonin is trying to cool your core and it does that by pushing all the blood to your hands and feet. It makes it hard to do that if your hands and feet are cold. And so it's very hard to go to sleep if you've got cold hands and feet. And so if you do suffer that in the evening, then it's often good to have a shower or a bath at least one hour before you go to bed and that can help with that. And um, yeah, don't watch the clock overnight. It doesn't matter what time it is. And it's just reinforcing when you're awake and try and avoid the dogs and the cats waking you up all night as well. You can't force sleep to happen. And if you're not asleep within about 20 minutes or so without looking at the clock, then you can get up, go and do something quiet, glass of water, read something light, and then go back to bed again. But don't start watching TVs or movies or doing chores or phoning people in the UK or whatever people do. Um, and again, we're just trying to link your bed more with sleep, not with stressing about sleep. Relaxing. So if you can't shut your mind off during the day, it can be useful to actually set a little bit of worry time aside. We tend to work, 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 do chores, watch the TV, do, do, do. And the first time 
we've actually stopped and let our brain just be free flow as when we're lying in bed. So actually give your brain a bit of time to do that earlier in the day. And it doesn't mean you'll solve every problem, but if it comes into your brain, you're more likely to let it go. Hour before bed, wind down. Try calming your mind. And, you know, if you do get anxious thoughts, just acknowledge them and just try and replace them again. Anxiety is like a toddler. It never stops talking. It tells you you're wrong about everything. And it wakes you up at 3 a.m. And, you know, some people will give their anxiety a name and it, will, it gives you a bit more control of it. Try and distance yourself from it a little bit. And I just call it my toddler. <laughs> So what does anxiety do? Again, if you're having these brief awakenings in your dreaming sleep, it will make you wake up. You'll be aware that you're awake and you're less likely to go back to sleep. And it's also going to interfere with your ability to go to sleep earlier in the evening. And for further information, there's a really good podcast I discovered recently by Michael Mosley, and um, it's on the BBC. And it really just, um, quite short podcast, just goes through all those for relaxation, Headspace app or, or the CAM. Um, site and the Sleep Health Foundation, which there, there is a .org .nz since I made that slide a long time ago. Um, but yeah, it's the same information. It's got lots of lots of sleep information on it. So I'll stop there. But I'm sure there may be questions. Thank you. Thank you, Doran. Thank you. Lots. I'll ask you just to pop up here. Any burning questions? <clears throat> From the audience, I heard someone gasp when they mentioned Ventolin. So we're just going to um, ask you to speak into the mic if that's okay, just so everyone on Zoom can hear you. Thanks, Lexi. And we, oh, when you answer, I'm going to get you to pop back up there. Is that all right? Sorry, otherwise it's just because of the Zoom camera. I'm trying to be compliant. Hit us with your hard question. Thank you very much, uh, Lutz and Doran, for your uh, great presentations, helpful. Question for Doran. Um, you showed a graph with regard to sleep apnea and the impact on uh, heart rate. Would you like to discuss or give a bit more information in patients with moderate to severe sleep apnea and the risk of coronary heart disease? That was a nice light question to start the uh, take. Thank you, Doran. Yeah, and I mean, that's really key, um, that the fact that people are stopping breathing and sleepy is just really the red flag. And um, so we know that people with moderate and severe sleep apnea have an increased risk of atrial fibrillation, of palpitations, of myocardial infarction, of sudden death overnight. Um, and yeah, it is just has this massive impact because of the stress response going on all night. The blood pressure is increased. It's having the metabolic effect on the sugars and the cholesterol. And these are all cardiovascular risk factors, which increases um, risk of stroke and heart attack. And, and as I say, atrial fibrillation as well. Um, Lutz may have more to add. No, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a question here and then a question there. Got some wonderful assistance. Thank you. Your question? Uh, since getting brain injury, sleep has not been good. Why is that? And apart from what you've suggested there, what else can one do? Yeah, it's not uncommon after a head injury that sleep can be affected. Um, I, I'm not a neurologist, I'm not 100% why, but it certainly has been observed. Um, I think, I mean, as I said, I could speak for a long time on sleep, and that was a kind of a, a bit of a, a sort of compression of facts. So I think if someone is really struggling, it is good to have a really good um, consultation with someone preferably for an hour if you can because that's what I spend time is getting a very good sleep history finding out I go through what's happening over 24 hours for somebody I start in the morning and work through their day because that all has an impact on their sleep cycle um, I, and mostly the way I look at it is there's a lot of sleep rules and if you're sleeping well then you don't need to follow them so well but if you're not sleeping then you do need to be a lot stricter with the sleep rules 
And I didn't mention medication at all because that's a whole massive topic, but medication can be useful, but it's obviously has addiction potential, has can have a lot of side effects. So medication can be used with caution. It, it's good for short-term limited use. And um, yeah, there's, there are different options out there, but I think what I always think anything in medicine, the most important thing is a really good history and that takes time. And I think spending an hour going through someone's sleep history can be very rewarding. Uh, Doreen, can I add to that? So in terms of for uh, our community members, is that best done through visiting their GP or asking for a referral to an, a, a different service? Yeah, um, I, ideally, it, I think people should be able to do it through the GP. And I have tried to um, provide sleep education for some of the GPs in the region over the years. But in practice, general practice is under a lot of pressure at the moment. And being able to provide an hour's consultation with somebody is pretty unrealistic. I try and do that in my practice, but that's because I have an interest in sleep medicine. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it's something that people do have to fund privately themselves or make the commitment to go back to the GP three or four times and just view it as something that you're maybe not going to sort out in one setting but you know over three or four visits you can you can spend an hour um, and that's another way to do it. Thank you and there's a, a lovely man right here who's got one like sorry let's see he's got a nice polo shirt on oh no sorry we're just going to get you to speak in the mic if that's okay just so everyone on zoom can hear. Sorry about that, I didn't know. Um, I've been on Ventolin for 45 years now, and I think I can agree it has caused uh, soreness around the throat uh, and a lot of coughing. I've never known what the coughing was caused by. I'm now on salbutamol. Sorry, I was on salbutamol. I've just changed in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but I think, I don't think it's much different. So that was just a comment. But a comment, I snore quite a lot. And I think this is probably caused, you have just made the comment, narrow throat. I, I have definitely got a narrow throat. It, uh, and is there anything I can do about this? I think that's a tag team question. So, I, so I think I'm hoping that your asthma is now better managed, yeah. was my question. That's actually quite a, a, a nice observation. So 45 years ago, we didn't have any other medications, and there was great to have Ventolin around, and we, we moved on from Ventolin. And as you get it offered, hopefully your cough uh, settles down. That would be another uh, another discussion. I stay in my lane, uh, but I, I, I'll see if Doreen has an answer on what to do about a narrow throat. You probably can't do much about the narrow throat, but you can still use an air cushion to keep it open. But did you, <laughs> like the CPAP machine, uh, is this what you would have said now that I've stolen your uh, coat? Yeah. So, uh, so uh, the- It's an advantage to the CPAP. Yes, so we often link sleep apnea to high body weight. However, there are Doreen slides, so there are more reasons for sleep apnea. And the CPAP machine, the air cushion, the air, air splint, works just as well in a narrow throat than to compare to a throat which is narrowed outside to increased fat tissue. So I would suggest you go to your GP and you might, you might get some benefit from a CPAP machine. Thank you. Now, there is a question that's come in online um, around, uh, sorry, they've said that they enjoyed both your presentations, um, but I want to keep you on your toes. They said, um, can you please expand um, on the findings about what are the risks? So you both have talked about smoking, but neither of you talked about vaping. Um, and vaping, vaping is on the increase in Aotearoa and uh, what looks like a broad range of age groups. Um, so is there the same risk when we think about the breathing, whether it's sleep apnea or asthma? What is the research telling us about the impact of vaping on both these things? Okay, I'm going to go lots and then Doran. Thank you for this question. New Zealand has embraced a vape to quit strategy. New Zealand is quite special in this way. Other countries around the world, like Australia or Singapore, said, 
for goodness sake, we have got enough problems with smoking. We don't want vaping as well. The UK has said anything must be better than smoking. Vape as much as you want. So New Zealand is quite special, and we are in a quite a special time in New Zealand. Uh, I, I think it's, a, it's quite a fascinating show as New Zealand has made. As for security positions, we have a clear opinion that the lungs are designed to breathe fresh, clean air. If, you, if vaping is part of your journey to stop smoking, that is perfectly all right. We think to stick up vaping just because you want something else to stick in your mouth is a silly thing to do. However, the evidence is not quite there. And it's a bit sort of, we are almost reliving the times from the 1970s and 80s where the cigarette companies kept saying, show me, show me that smoking is bad. It's not there yet. It was there, but the evidence, uh, they played the game for quite a while. Uh, vaping also irritates the airways. Vaping would make asthma worse. And vaping probably has long-term effects. However, nobody has been able to do long-term studies because it hasn't been around for long enough. So from a respiratory point of view, we are happy to support the New Zealand vape to, uh, uh, vape to quit strategy. It's a, it's a great idea. And then if vaping is part of the journey to skip smoking, we are supportive of it. Um, again, just regard sleep apnea, the reason we feel that smoking has an impact is, is often with smokers that there's more inflammation in the throat anyway. So again, it's something that's making the throat smaller and also because of the carbon monoxide in the cigarettes, your oxygen levels can be running a bit lower as well. So it's already having an impact there. I'm not really an expert on vaping, but again, it's probably having that inflammatory effect on the back of the throat, which is naturally narrowing the airways a bit as well. Right at the back. And can I, uh, we've just got a question at the back. And why are you coming? There, there's uh, some research that Lutz and I uh, did with uh, uh, vaping to stop smoking. And we've got some of the students in here. Yes, thank you. Um, is that actually there's some complexities uh, because a lot of people uh, vape and don't quit smoking and so end up still smoking or end up doing both. Um, and so the long-term impacts of both are, are complicated and we're still measuring, but it's, it's an interesting field. At the back. Um, I've just got a, a question related to breathing and wondered what the relevance of hypocapnemia is. Um, hypocapnia. And um, I've got a family member who is very fit and active and has had long COVID um, and suffered from fatigue, but it turns out that her carbon dioxide levels were very, very low and they measure the oxygen intake, which is fine, but there seems to be a, a quite a significant difference in um, after breathing um, course. It was a, um, extreme um, benefit with getting her breathing under control. Um, and I just wondered why do they not, um, do they look at that as a part of um, breathing problems? Um, or also using an inhaler, that's been stopped and that's improved things. And that was, um, they said that that was aggravating it. Um, mm. So I just wondered, is there, with long COVID, um, is there not more um, research into this or? Research on long COVID is still coming out. The low carbon dioxide, the hypocapnia, it's actually a common problem. It's actually the reason why people in the olden days fell over at rock concerts. Uh, you, when you start hyperventilating, you start, uh, you start developing all sorts of muscle spasms. You start becoming anxious. You start getting a funny feel around the mouth. And bizarrely, you start feeling short of breath and you breathe even more. So the hyperventilation part, which may in long COVID be triggered by some brain inflammation, and then you end up in this vicious circle. The hyper, hyper, um, the hyperventilation part is well, is well researched, well described, and, we, and often our physiotherapy colleagues are very good on uh, identifying it, measuring it, and providing some help and guidance on how to manage the uh, on how to manage the hyperventilation. So hyperventilation, breathing too much thereby getting low carbon dioxide and all sorts of symptoms. 
as far as the long COVID is concerned, we are really very on as far as research is concerned. I think it's plausible that some brain inflammation, which was part of COVID, triggered off this, uh, uh, this aspect. And bizarrely, indeed, people come to the doctor feeling short of breath, however, breathing too much, but we, we, we may go down the wrong way and you really need to do blood gas, which is quite invasive uh, before you develop a diagnose the hypercapnia. That's probably enough, <laughs> but it's an important, uh, it's, a, it's a very important medical problem and uh, often gets misdiagnosed. Thank you. Okay, we've got someone there and then someone here. Thank you very much for the presentation. My question, and I'll keep it brief, um, does sleep apnea in time heal when you do the right things? And um, just much much like when, when you have asthma when you're a child, eventually you get out of it. Does sleep apnea do the same thing? And does sinus, having sinus contribute to that? And also, as far as the bird, do we shoot the bird away from our back garden because uh, and not feed them at all? So just uh, sorry. I know I've worked with lots for twenty two years. I've never heard the bird story. It was quite traumatic. Yeah, let's go. To, let's go, to Um, it depends what's causing your sleep apnea. So if somebody is um, overweight and they're smoking and they're drinking too much alcohol, then making those changes um, can often cure their sleep apnea. Um. But unfortunately, there are a group of people who aren't overweight, who can have a very narrow airway. Um, ENT surgeons sometimes can cut bits of the airway away, but if someone has a very narrow throat, then um, that can, often can't be changed. So some people, you can't cure it and you're managing it and the CPAP will completely treat it um, while they're using it and they're just using CPAP every night and it will be completely treated. And the, what I love about CPAP is it's a very, very good treatment. It's not a drug. It has minimal side effects and, and it works really well. So it, we manage it really well. It was invented in um, Australia in the late 70s and nothing better has come along. But um, yeah. And again, um, you know, the mouth guard for some people will, will work really well. Um, so there are some modifiable factors in some people, but some people it's just that's that's the way it is. Sinus, um, sometimes if people are prone to sinus, they tend to have narrow airways anyway, so there can be a link there. Um, and shooting the birds, um, that's, I'll leave that one to <laughs> Lewis. <laughs> Oh, sorry. sorry. There's just there's one there's one further question. Sorry, while we're on narrowing the throat, which seems a good theme for today, and I haven't got my glasses on, but can chronic allergic rhinitis also narrow the throat? Um, yeah. So again, it's some chronic allergic rhinitis just means generally someone may have hay fever or or allergies to something else, and they're tending to get narrowing of the airways. So that can happen in the nose, but also at the back of the nose as well. And again, if you if you've got narrow airways, you can be more likely to have sleep apnea. But it's sometimes if you treat the allergic rhinitis, then it may solve a lot or some of the problem. But it's just there's a cross a crossover with those conditions. Thank you, Darren. And uh, lots the bird. Leave the poor birds alone. <laughs> True. No, but 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 even this is fine. You're allowed to feed the birds. It's all fine. So it's not about the birds. It's about the protein that comes from the birds, or it's about the bird poo. So don't let the bird poo dry, and then it becomes of a dust, and then inhale it. So the birds are fine. The feedings are fine. Best leave them in the bush, uh, and uh, but it's sort of the 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 protein related to the birds, which some of us react quite allergic to. It's actually not only birds. There's a whole illness called allergic alveolitis. It's the same as farmer's lung or a bird a bird fancier's lung. There are many of these illnesses where our lungs re have an allergic reaction to a certain protein. I find I picked on the birds because this, is, this seems like a very easy one to solve, much easier than lung transplantations. But so it's a dry bird poo, which we are really concerned about. <laughs> Thank you. And then I think we're going to take our last question. Thank you from the middle of the room. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yep. Yes. Um, I've got all sorts of respiratory issues. It's not just sleep apnea, but I, you know, have diabetes and other conditions as well. But I've been given a, I'm onto my, I think my second um, CPAP machine. Why 
are, are you not tested then afterwards to see if it's actually working okay? Because I still suffer from severe sleepiness during the day. Like I can fall asleep during the day. But why, why when you get the machine, is it not followed up to see if it's actually doing what it should be doing? Yeah. I mean, I've been on a machine now for, for years and years and years. Yeah. Uh, who's currently managing you? Are you? Is that through the GP or are you going through uh, the sleep clinic? Well, I was through the sleep clinic, but that okay. seems to have disappeared. Okay. Is it closed? Is that correct? And um, I'm going to lean in on my Nelson Marlborough colleagues about the services. Um, yeah, so generally um, when somebody gets set up on CPAP, and I'm assuming this happened when, when you did, is that um, and our machines nowadays, if I had used a CPAP machine overnight, um, I can speak to somebody the next day and they can monitor my machine. They know exactly what's happening. So they would know exactly if I'd been breathing all night, if I was still stopping breathing, if my mask was leaking. And so I would speak to somebody every day for the first few days when I was getting up on my set up on my CPAP machine. And so their goal is to get someone set up so they know exactly what's happening. Is it working? How's it going? And then... Um, somebody then, then goes off but if somebody was then struggling they they would normally um, either speak to the GP or just get back in contact with the clinic and they can get retested so it may be that the math um, the sleep well clinic was on Vanguard Street and it's moved around to Buxton Square so it's still the same phone numbers and everything like that yeah yeah so it's still there if, if that's what you were dealing with before yeah but yeah the sh Test. Yeah, so it's really important to define what's causing the sleepiness. And um, so is it, is it the sleep apnea? Is the sleep apnea being treated properly? If the sleep apnea is being treated properly, then you would start to look for other causes of sleepiness as well. So it's defining the problem and then managing it. Thanks. And well, I said that was the last question. I, I want to be mindful that we've had a lot of people join us um, on Zoom. And actually, both of them, looks, uh, it's, a, it's questions in relation to COVID and long COVID and, in, and whether we've seen an increase in asthma symptoms. Sorry for Glenn and Kayleen, I've kind of shoved your questions together. And actually the asthma and COVID is actually quite fascinating. And so, uh, because as, uh, if you remember, as COVID sort of took hold of the country, we were quite concerned about COVID causing more asthma attacks. And this did not happen. When we, pub when we, when we measured the first time, we said, oh, our patients are so sensible. They just have been so careful. And then we keep measuring it and keep measuring it. And actually, what turns out that this inhaled steroid in the red inhaler, which I just showed you, but actually all inhaled steroids, but that this inhaled steroid is downregulating the receptors which should, which the COVID virus needed to attack patients. So the company which I showed you has actually made a bid to Pharmac and saying, can we just give it to the whole country to avoid COVID symptoms? Pharmac didn't quite buy into it. But uh, so, so far we have been very lucky that COVID has not caused more asthma. And it's another sort of uh, people who had been good taking the inhaled stores in the red inhaler had an extra benefit uh, that they were less likely to get COVID. And if they did get COVID, the illness was less severe. There's some ongoing research going on about long COVID. And we really don't know much as, as yet. It looks like that uh, luckily, uh, unless you're one of the few people who ended up with really bad lung disease in hospital, the breathlessness which some people experience after long COVID, we just had one example being related to probably brain inflammation, hyperventilation, and many other people are probably related to more cardiac involvement with the long COVID rather than lung involvement. So we don't, we still need more research. We still don't know. Luckily, we have not seen excess respiratory illnesses, neither in asthma nor in other respiratory illnesses with COVID. So we're quite lucky there. But 10% of people end up with long COVID, which is about 50 million around the world. So there's still a lot to do.
I just really want to thank you all for coming out on this most beautiful Nelson day. You can tell I'm from Christchurch, not from Nelson, right? Because there's actually heat attached to your sun out there. Um, and coming into this dark movie theatre for the last hour and spending time with us. Um, I want to thank both Lutz and Doran, who I think have been amazing and entertaining on something that could have uh, been quite boring from my remem from remembrance of lecture days and days gone old. And just really want to thank them for making this both entertaining and really informative. Um, and I also want to again give a huge shout out to the Care Foundation based here in the Nelson Melbourne area who make uh, afternoons like this possible. So kia ora and thank you to everybody. Okay, and I'm going to hand the time back to my colleague. Uh, a tēnā koutou anō, um, uh, kei te miha tū ki a koutou uh, uh, ki te um, noho ki konei, uh, ki tēnei, um, uh, ki tēnei uh, kōrero um, a korangi. Um, uh, tēnā koutou kei te mihi. Um, he kara ki a whakamutunga tēnei, uh, unuhia, unuhia, unuhia te uru tapu nui, ki a wātia, ki a māma te ngākau, ki tīnana, te wairua e, e te ara takutu, ko te rā e rongo whakahiria, ake ki ronga, ki te ki a wātea, ki a wātea, ai um, rā kua ki a wātea, humie, uie, tāi ki e. Kia ora.